July 19th, 1989, United Flight Airlines 232, carrying 290 passengers, was en route from Denver to Chicago. Now, all was progressing normally until suddenly, suddenly a loud bang rattled the aircraft at 3.16 p.m. at 37,000 feet. This bang was, in fact, the flight's engine exploding, disintegrating, and taking with it the horizontal stabilizer and the lines to all three hydraulic systems. Seated just a few rows back from the cockpit was a guy called Dennis Finch. As it would turn out, he was a United Airlines offline, off-duty flight instructor who had spent his whole career teaching pilots what to do in emergency situations. Wait a minute, you guys look really confused. This is the Aviation 2018 General World Forum, right? Just kidding. I know this doesn't make sense right now, but it will very soon, trust me on this. Now, it's also about here where I say my first disclaimer. If you don't understand a word I'm saying, it is completely normal. I am from a place very far away from here. A place that basically, if I drilled a hole through the bottom of the stage, right through the planet, I'd probably come out in my mum's dining room. Now, I come from a place that doesn't really get affected by world issues the same way we do here. I was pertinently reminded of this not too long ago after reading The Guardian. New Zealand declares to expel all Russian spies, but can't find any. <laughs> now, it's these kind of issues that I've faced growing up being in a small little place, I've had this hunger to get out and explore the world and to try and build something at a global level. So I made it my mission as a founder to make something incredible. But on the other hand, I made it my mission as a psychology junkie to try and mix human behavior and psychology into the process. So before I get too far, let me... Let me ensure that things start to make a little bit more sense. I want you guys to go back to the aeroplane. I want you to close your eyes if you want to. I want you to imagine what it would be like at 37,000 feet in the cockpit. Imagine hearing no engines buzzing, watching the, race t the racing clock tick by, feel your gut twisting, feel your heart thumping. What would you do? What would I do? See, I'm the kind of person that always finds a solution, so I'm pretty sure there would be a few, albeit limited, options. But what would they be? <sighs> Option one, I am the boss. I take control of the situation, I bellow out instructions confidently, although in reality I'm not even sure if they're going to work, but it doesn't matter. I ignore what the gauges are telling me, I ignore what the people are telling me. I'm in the plane, this is my plane and I'm in charge. Fair enough, I definitely know a few people that would go for that option. Option two, oh my God, I take my hands off the steering wheel, wait, steering wheel? Is it called a steering wheel on a plane? I think so. Or I take my hands off the wheel. I have absolutely no idea what to do, but I know there's hundreds of sensors running all around the aircraft. They've been developed by some amazing technology and I'm pretty sure that the flight management system is gonna have everything under control. So I just sit back and I let the technology take over and I'm pretty sure, well, I hope that we're gonna land this thing. Option three, I act like a human. I take a look at what the gauges are telling me, but I don't let them dictate my decisions. I look around me and see what human resources I have around me. But above all, I listen to my gut instinct and I do whatever I can to make sure this plane lands. Now, if we take a step back for a moment, isn't it funny that these strategies are often quite similar across multiple different environments, be it at 37,000 feet in my startup office in the dining room? What option do you think Captain Haynes, the pilot of Flight 232, took that day? He opted for option three. 
He brought the unknown Finch into the cockpit without question. He placed him directly in the center of himself and his co-pilot in a clear distribution of power. He looked at the gauges, but didn't let them decide what he was going to do. He embraced what everything was happening around him, and he communicated in non-verbal language. And what they went on to do was pull off one of the most incredible recoveries from catastrophic engine failure to date. They managed to bring that plane down from 37,000 feet to a near tarmac landing. 195 people survived that day, 13 of which walked away uninjured. For those that unfortunately did lose their life that day, it was primarily due to smoke inhalation after landing. Now, human-centric thinking, combining technology and humanness, what does this all mean? Let me take you a little bit on my journey. So I'm honest, when I first started my second startup at 22, I was terrified. I was in this foreign place, I didn't know the language, I didn't know what was going on. And above all, I didn't have an, a background in computer science. In fact, I was kind of reminded of this after someone said, do you like Raspberry Pi? For which I just said, delicious, only to find out it's actually a credit card sized computer processor. In fact, my background is actually international relations, psychology, it's law. I didn't think that this would fit in starting a technology company until I stepped foot on an airplane bound for the Silicon Valley. I was fortunate enough to wander around the campuses of Google, Facebook, and Twitter. And as a young 22-year-old, I just stood there in awe of what I was seeing. I saw people scooting around on scooters. I saw them chowing down endless amounts of free food at communal tables. I saw them having a nap in sleeping pods. But above all, I saw them working super hard. I was so excited to see that one of the world's most successful technology companies was human-centric. So upon getting back on that plane back to Europe, I decided that it would be my personal mission to use and embrace what I had learned over the past few years in psychology and human behavior and international relations and try and integrate that back into my company. Now, there are a few challenges about this. I came back to Luxembourg, and as amazing as it is, it's a very conservative place. Over here, burnouts are badges of honor. Hours of work are one of the only measures of success. But I knew I wanted to change this. The second challenge was my board. You see, I couldn't just rock up and say, Hey guys, how about we get a little bit more human? They wouldn't really take it. I had to find research and data and measurable outcomes so that I could illustrate to them that this was a good strategy. So I spent a lot of time looking into the research, trying to find the links between human behavior and successful leadership, successful companies. And finally, I came across a really interesting study by Google. The project was called Project Aristotle. And what this project set out to do was to understand what drove performance, what drove the most successful teams within Google to be successful. So they teamed up with some of the country's leading research units, and they tested almost every single variable you can imagine in their teams. They tested things like the ratio to introverts versus extroverts. They tested things like whether the team socialized inside or outside the workplace. They tested diversity, gender differences, standing desks, everything you can imagine Google and the researchers studied. And so what did the biggest search engine find? See what I did there? Nothing. Not one single significant correlation that was consistent across all of the teams. Now, as you can imagine, this was extremely frustrating for Google, but also the researchers that had dedicated so much time to trying to crack this challenge. So, of course, they didn't stop there. Their frustration led them to look at the data differently. They started to group the variables under different umbrellas until finally things started to make sense. And what did they find? What did they find to be the sole most 
significant factor to building successful teams within Google? Two words. Psychological safety. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to light the incense or get all Freudian on you just now. In fact, the answer to this question is quite simple. It's very obvious of what it is. It's the idea of being free from risk. The official definition in the study was not fearing the negative consequences associated with risk-taking for yourself, your image, and your career. Now, to be honest, at this time I was 23. I was super naive. I was like, of course my team is psychologically safe. Are you kidding? I just installed a beer keg and a ping pong table and a giant inflatable gorilla. What else do you need to be successful and not scared of risk? But they weren't. Oh, how wrong I was. After really sitting down with my team members and talking to them one-to-one -one at a human level, I understood that they were still weren't themselves. They were still scared to do certain things. And so we worked really, really, really hard as a company, as a growing startup company with limited resources, to try and make this human-centric way of thinking paramount. And what let us know that our teams and our company was becoming more psychologically safe? It's a little bit embarrassing to admit, to be honest. Open office screaming matches. I would just sit there at my desk and I would see this person who was previously timid and terrified to say a word, defending his point of view like his life depended on it. And I was so proud. Think about it, it's just like your siblings. You can have some raging arguments and you can hate each other, but at the end of the day, you know everything will be fine. It was exactly this kind of point of view. So for me, as a founder, I was very proud, but it was still just one piece of the puzzle. The foundations of our company, our team, and our culture were human-driven and human-centric, but we still had two huge challenges, our technology and our market. Now, to be honest, our market was pretty straightforward because we've worked on that for a long time as placing the human in the driving seat. But the market, on the other hand, was another challenge. You see, it's an interesting place to be being a, a startup millennial technology founder. People look at you as if you're from Mars sometimes. I remember sitting down with some of our potential customers and the mere whisper of AI or machine learning and they were sure that a bunch of killer robots were about to emerge out of the cleaning cupboard and destroy human beings for all that we know of it. And it got me thinking. Were people really scared of the killer robots? Hey, don't get me wrong, I'm totally scared of killer robots. But were they scared of other things? Were they scared of the unknown? Now, it's quite a funny world because us as humans, our most precious, arguably, cognitive resource is the most precious thing we have. And the idea of handing over this precious asset to a machine maybe make, make us think that we're going to drop down a few levels on the food chain. And there's another really bizarre thing that I found from talking with our, with our potential customers and, and even people in general, was that the relationship between human beings and computers is extremely bizarre. Think about this one. Humans get older, they get bigger, but eventually they get dimmer. Computers get older, they get smaller, and they get smarter. Now this, to try and understand, to try and comprehend from a human level, is scary. But one thing I really wanted to work about with our customers, and one thing we focus a lot with our technology, is that you can outsource not necessarily the most perfect things. You can outsource some of the things that you don't really need to be doing, some of the boring tasks, some of the processing power that we can free up for much other cooler stuff. So I gave them the example of the calculator. Before the calculator, people would have to crunch things in their head, and it would take time, and it would be frustrating, and they'd have to do the same thing over and over again. With the calculator and the human brain, they could outsource a lot of the boring stuff, so they could actually truly work and find amazing stuff. And they could also do things like spell boobs. 
Did anyone do this in school? Sorry, I just had to include it. Pivotal part of my early childhood. So I want to sum up here. Eventually, when our customers started to come around, they could understand that they were actually forming a pivotal part of technology. We all are. And if the interaction between human behaviour and technology can help a plane land from 37,000 feet without engines, don't you think that it can help us and our companies in some of the riskiest phases of our life? It is more important than ever before that we focus on the future. I'm not just speaking right now as a technology founder, I'm speaking right now as a mother. We have to do whatever we can for our next generation. It is up to us to build the strongest technology companies, the strongest companies in general, and the strongest people to face the challenges that we're going to face. And trust me, I think we all know there will be many. So I lay you with this challenge. In a world of artificial intelligence, of machine learning, of virtual reality, and of internet-connected devices, I challenge you to be human. Thank you.